Welcome to uh, an introduction to using BIM data in Revit. If you're here and talked to a lot of some of you already, I think at the islands, but um, BIM data is something that you're interested in and you want to be able to use it inside your application. Um, the three of us up here appreciate you coming. My name is Jeff Reinhardt. To my left is um, David Alvarez, and he's on a product engineer like myself on the AEC CAD team, and he deals with a lot of the Revit um, implementations that he's done. And David has a past life before Esri where he was a what would you call yourself, David? All, chief cook and bottle wash of all the Revit information. So, yeah, so if I have any problems in Revit, I talk to David and he can bail me out. So that's good. And to my further left is Michael Contreras. Michael Contreras is um, a not on the BIM team, but he's a 3D specialist. He has a deep experience in Revit and BIM and 3D, and he's been working on that field, in that field for a number of years. I think you've been, Michael, have you hit the 10 years yet for Esri? Just hit 10 years, all right, congratulations. Yeah, I know, you used to have hair, I get it, I understand, I understand. So anyway, so anyway, so that, that's what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna go through, we've got a small intimate audience here, I think, and we just wanna go through and give you some ideas what we're, what's going on in BIM and um, some of the things that you can do with it and uh, we'll go from there. If, we're not gonna have a whole bunch of time for questions during the session, it'll be difficult because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So if you do have questions, hold on to them at the end. You can come up and talk or just yell them out to us. If we, for some reason, get through this quickly, then we can, uh, we'll have more times as well. But anyways, hold on to it if you could, please. I'd appreciate it. So what do we want to accomplish? An overview of the topics that we want to do. First of all, we want to go, what is BIM and what is Revit? And it's, it's surprising to me, talking and understanding people, is they're not really even sure what BIM is and if, is Revit BIM and is BIM Revit? There's that confusion. So I want to go into that a little bit. Um, if, if you know all this stuff, let me know, but you'll have to uh, suffer my talking for a while otherwise. Um, I also want to go into the direct read of Revit files in ArcGIS Pro itself. If you've, some of you have, have already asked, have been using that already. We're going to go in to show you some of the, um, some of the pieces and, and why they're there and, and what, what you can do with them. Um, then we're going to switch gears and go into positioning, just like CAD data you have to have a, a proper coordinate system within a Revit file for it to be read with an ArcGIS. And David is gonna go through an example of that and how to accomplish that and get a um, properly located Revit file. Along with that, we're gonna dive in a little bit to the conversion of Revit to Geodat GeoDatabase. Um, and I'll ask questions about that a little further along, but we'll go into that. I don't think we'll demo that today, but I wanna show you and talk you how that works. But Michael is gonna catch the back end of that, and he's actually gonna grab those geodatabases and do some interesting things um, with those modifying geometry and attributes to go along with this. So why don't we hop in? So, building information model. What does it stand for, CC? Infrastructure, I call it building information modeling, whatever it's called, what is it? And really what it is, is, is um, it's a digital representation of a physical and functional characteristic of a family. That's a lot of words for a um, fancy topic, but really what it is, is just a, a representation of complex objects that have a relationship with each other. So if I have this room in my BIM file, I know that that light is hanging off that ceiling. I know that this floor is, is connected to the wall or the wall, there's a window in the wall or a door in the wall. It's just that idea of that connection and that's what really BIM is, is BIM is that, that data model to have that connection so we have these things that relate with each other and they maintain their geometry and their relations and their attributes. I think what gets lost a little bit is because Revit is 3D and it looks great on screen and it's beautiful to demo and, and it's beautiful to see, we forget the important, I think an important part of that is the geometry, but is also the attributes that come across with it as well. The attributes are a very important part of, of Revit as a data source because those are the things of getting at the properties of those geometries and all the things that you need from those to do whatever you wanna do with them beyond what, we're, what we've been working on. And also, um, yeah, so it's just, it's just that idea that visualizing it, and Revit data is just one of those things to visualize it. So, come on guys, lots of room, promise. So what I really wanna, I think what comes from this, for me anyways, is BIM is a process, not an application, right? And Revit data, Revit data is an application. It's not the process, Revit data consumes, um, it consumes data that's to the BIM standard. So Revit is not BIM, Revit is built for BIM. 
And that's, that's an important distinction. When I was putting this session together, I did a lot of Googling and, and come up with things, and I read a lot of people, but that was something that really stuck with me, um, really helps um, me describe to people what, what, what that's all about. So with the Revit model, it helps you um, interconnect data to your BIM standards. Like I mentioned before, I'll keep saying it, but I've got a curtain wall structure out there. I wanna know how thick that glass is, maybe what if it has other properties, um, retensive properties or things like that. I wanna be able to get at that information. And that's that smart object, not just geometry, but the attributal information as well. And, and importantly, I wanna have multiple views as well, but I wanna collaborate that with my Revit people and my GIS people, right? And that's why we've been working on that project the last couple of years um, of getting that, that standard in there. So there's other, uh, to answer maybe to ward off a couple questions, um, BIM standards, I'll ask some questions. Who here deals with IFC? Okay, there's a couple of you. So, that, so if I'm with you, I'm gonna ask me the question of what about IFC? How come we haven't got IFC put it there? And the, and the answer to that is we, we're aware of that, we know that, we started with BIM, or we started with, um, with, with IFC and we are, our, our, sorry, BIM, we're gonna start, go to IFC, I'm mumbling. Um, but we're gonna, that's on our roadmap. That's not something that's gonna come in 2.5, but it's definitely something on a roadmap that we wanna to get towards. Is anybody using Bentley architecture? Okay, we got a couple of those as well. So that's, uh, that's under the same umbrella as well. We got a small team. We're working on things that's definitely on something we're looking at, but it'll be a little further out than even IFC will be. So, and there's other softwares as well. I guess I could pull you, but I don't think I will. All right, so this is Revit application, just a little view into it. Um, I feel like a peeping Tom, I'm, this is David's side, peeping through the, in somebody's window. But um, what this is, is a predefined with software that cannot be added or deleted or renamed. That's the categories, right? So in every Revit model, we have, we have architectural, we have, um, um, I'm blanking, architectural, electrical, we have all these families that are in the Revit file, and that's what, the way AutoCAD is constructed, which is following um, the standard. So what we do is we have those things that are inside of them, we're gonna have our walls, our doors, our floors, our stairs, and beams, and other things as well. And within these families, it's a collection like of sharing these basic families, we're gonna have multiple kinds of walls and things that we share together. So, for those of you that haven't seen Revit in Pro, let's, here it is. So if you bring up ArcGIS Pro, it's gonna show you um, a Revit workspace, and um, in that Revit workspace is actually the Revit model. So what I put here is I put the kind of, the, the words that mean the difference between the Revit model of what we're calling is a building workspace, and that's that RVT file. Within the grouping activities, we have these building discipline data sets, and that's that architectural, electrical, mechanical, piping, and structural. And all those are in every Revit model, whether they're populated or not, they're in every single Revit model, so we have to read those. Um, as you can see, I attempted to do with colors, but maybe badly, but you, you see the architectural, for example, if we go down to the Revit categories, which are the building feature classes, that's your doors, your walls, your roof, your whatever feature class you're interested in, along with say piping, for example, where you have your flex pipes and sprinklers. So that's how things are organized when you look at it. It looks very familiar, it should look familiar for used to dealing with CAD data in Pro. It's a very similar paradigm. It's a direct read format that we read directly inside of ArcGIS Pro. So when you're, when you're looking at this, we have different ways of viewing it. We have a Revit workspace with our, our discipline data sets and our building feature layers, but we also have an, a, um, a concept of an exterior building or exterior shell. In Revit, if you ask David to create a, um, a Revit model for me, one of the things he'll denote in the Revit model, he'll tell me if something is exterior or interior. I think actually what you do is you denote that it's interior and then everything is excluded as exterior, I believe, right, David? Yeah, and so that's a concept that we did in, inside of pros. We wanna make sure that we capture that information because that is an important part of when you're viewing or using your Revit models. You wanna get your exterior information as a quick reference or a quick view of that. And so we wanna make sure we added those things in there as well. So the one unique thing about this is the exterior shell has a different behavior, whether it's added as a workspace or a feature class. And I just wanted to reiterate here as well, and I'll show you in a demo in a few minutes how that works, but I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. But the interesting thing here is 
that there's different kinds of attributes that are read from the Revit file. We have our core attributes from Revit file. I know, um, th you know the structure of the wall and has all the attributes to do with that. But we also have our custom attributes as well. So if I have a chair or a desk and it's a specific kind of desk from a vendor, we try and do the best job we can to get those attributes as well. I know it's a Herman Miller chair and it's a model this and the color of that, all that kind of information. So that's something that we get as well with the custom attributes. So that, that's a pretty picture of it, but why don't we jump into a um, example. Okay, so that's good, okay, great. So, I'm, oh, I'm just gonna remove this here, but. So as you can see here, in my catalog window in Pro, I've got some Revit models. The one I wanna focus on is um, the one that I showed you in the slides with the, the attribute building UC 2019. And um, so if we expand these, we can take a look at the different feature classes that come within it. As you see, the architectural is the largest by many and there's a lot of different feature classes that come across. Be aware that not every Revit model is gonna have all these things, but we do bring these um, blank feature classes across, have you, because the Revit model can change. We're, we're aware of that and that it could come across. So all these things come across. You see predominantly it's gonna be multi-patch feature classes, but there's also points as well in there, but that's how they're gonna come across. And if we expand this into electrical, it's the same thing, right? We have all these feature classes that come from the Revit file and we're gonna capture those as well. And you can go down the line, you can see your mechanical, your piping, they're shrinking a little bit, but these are the feature classes that we display in as well. So if we wanna go and add this to Give it a minute. All right, great. So this admin building should be somewhere in Ohio, I believe. Let's zoom to the layer. Great. All right, so there, so what I want to show you here now is the, the structure of what we've done here. By default, when you add this Revit workspace, we actually added all the data sets, the discipline data sets and the feature classes, but we have not turned them all on. And that's that's on purpose because it's very expensive of, of you guys know and working with Revit Data and Pro, it's a very expensive process. And to be able to uh, render all these things by default, it, it could slow things down. So what we've done is we grab the exterior shell. So this is actually a feature layer that we've added and it is a sub, it's a basically contains all these feature layer or these layers from there. And these are actually out of the rest of the architectural, structural, electrical, but these are all the things that we denote that will be in the considered um, exterior. And that's why we show those. So that's fine. So we can zoom around, we can use this. It's pretty easy to use, it's, it's comfortable. Um, so what, what we can also do is we can turn things on and off. So I could turn that off and I could just turn on my um, architectural, for example, and then that would spin up. But, so that's one way to work with it. And give it a minute and it's coming back. Punch bug, no return, David. Anyway, so you get the idea that this architectural, it renders itself and adds it back to the scene. This is the, the pieces of that within that feature class that are getting added to it. And it just takes a few moments. The other thing you can do is, let's do a new one here. Let's go to another new local scene. So I don't have to take the entire drawing, as I mentioned before, we can just grab the architectural. And if I add my architectural, I'll give it a few moments, it's the biggest one. Expand that, let's zoom to it went. There it is again, it's in the same spot. It's bringing in its information, but you notice one thing that's different here is we've added all the feature classes or within that data set are on by default because that's what you're interested in. But what we've, what we've done is we've turned off the exterior shell. And the exterior shell is now off. Now we know that that's duplicate features compared to the other things. If you needed that, you could turn that on, but that's why we've um, dealt with it that way. And if I go into here, into this data set, I can go see the different features. I can use my identify. All right, well, you get the idea that catching up. 
There we go. And, and I can go around, I can select these things, find out about it and get my attributes. So if I look at that chair, it's gonna tell me that it's in the entourage category and the fam what family it's in. And it's giving me different attributal information about that chair. So those are, that's an important part of this as well as we're getting that information through to you as well. Anyways, but, all right. So I just wanted to give you a quick, quick idea how these things were added and how you could use these. You could play all day playing with this, but I better not. These guys got more interesting things to do. So, anyways, wanna, that's fine. So, let me get back to, one thing, you, I don't know if you noticed, and I wasn't gonna point it out to you, but um, did you notice where the Revit model was? Was it on land or was it blue? It was in the middle of the ocean, right? And that's probably, if you've worked with Revit data, you, you're aware of that situation where it's sitting in the middle of the ocean and it is, um, there's as tools that David's gonna show you how to georeference these things. Before we go and do that, I just wanted to cover a couple of details. In Pro 2.3.x, whatever that would be, we support 2013 to Revit 2018 files. And you see in 2.4, which is out now, um, fresh off the presses, we support up to AutoCAD 2019. For you that, that use it, I wanna mention one thing, just a little time saver is, um, when we use the files, we're using a third-party library that helps us read these files, but it has to be updated to the latest version that it supports. So if you give me a 2016 Revit file, we have to, in the background, upgrade it to the 2019 and look at that. So best case for more performant, you want to make sure that you try and get it saved in the latest um, Revit file that you can. Some things that we added in the 2.4 release as well um, that David and the rest of the team have worked on is we've added rooms and that's something I didn't show you but um, that the room support is, is added to the feature classes so that idea of spaces is uh, an important part of many of your workflows so we're happy we got that in there. Um, we've also have mass elements that have been added and then there's always along the way there's geometric and attributal refinements as we go along, so there's you know things about geometry start drawing just correctly, so we're making sure we're trying to catch all those, and if bugs come in, then we take care of that. One thing that's not on the list right here, if you notice, is we don't really support, we don't support textures or materials yet. So um, textures, we understand that this is an important thing that we wanna work towards, and in future releases, we will add support for textures, whether that's in 2.5 or whatever it ends up being in, we'll see. Um, but that's, that's definitely attainable for us. Materials are a little bit more difficult. There's a lot to materials. There's lots of nuances. They're really highly, um, they're uh, customizable. So they could be proprietary. They could have um, features that we'd have difficulty drawing. But in any case, um, just be aware that those things are coming. But anyways, what we, should, what we should talk about now is positioning Revit data in Pro. Like you said, like I saw, I came in the ocean, my file wasn't in the right place. That was pretty obvious. Um, one of the things we have is, I don't know if you've georeferenced 2D data before in or CAD data in Pro, but it's the same uh, workflow that you're gonna do in Revit as you do, do in CAD. And it's using the georeferencing toolbar along with um, a contextual ribbon that allows you to um, assign a PRJ file to your file and also a world file if needed. Oftentimes, unlike CAD, uh, we don't necessarily need that very often. The other thing as well is there's a survey point and a base point that we capture out of every Revit model and that can be important as David will go into about uh, positioning your Revit file. But instead of me talking about it, why don't you go ahead and show us, David. Sorry, can everybody hear me? Okay. Four. Okay, so uh, we're gonna use the same file that Jeff had. Um, it's a build-in, uh, and we're gonna locate it um, around Redlands. It's uh, the packing district. Uh, so surveyor, or basically the surveying company said, okay, here is where your building should be in that area, and that is the northwest uh, corner of the building. That's it, okay, that's perfect. Um, so first rule that we need to, especially working with Revit files, um, your coordinate system has to be a projected coordinate. This is only applies for the georeferencing process. Only for the georeferencing process, your 
coordinate system needs to be a projected. So it has to be a state plan, UTM, it could be Finland zone four, so that basically your units are meters or feet, or US feet. Um, okay, so I already have my uh, project, my coordinate for that corner, and it came out on California zone five, 83, 2011. Okay, so what we're gonna do, um, Try to reference the whole building all at once. It's kind of cumbersome because the geometry keeps moving while you tweak around. I said if I move a little bit the angle, so everything needs to be draw. Uh, so I prefer and I recommend you use floors or walls or the combination of both of them. It kind of helps you a little bit. So let's drag our floors. Okay. So if we zoom to it. So that is our building. If I turn off this, and it, so it's a little bit kind of little piece here, then you have a hole and then, um, so this is the sub-basement and I know because it's the data that I work with. This is a sub-basement, this is the basement and this is our first floor. So all the ground level should be up to this one. You also notice that it's a little bit elongated and the reason why is because there's a discrepancy on the units. Our units are in meters, so what we need to do is just change it to US feet. So now our X, Y, and C matches unit-wise. Okay, so there's our building. We put it back. So it's still in the ocean. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, so if you look at our tab to manage the rabbit file, or the BIM data is not active. It only becomes active until you select a, a layer that belongs to a rabbit file. So here we go, and Jeff shows the tool, so we're gonna go to your reference. Um, so immediately I click your reference, my rabbit file will inherit the projection of the scene. So that's why I basically make sure that the projection that my scene has is the one that I really like for georeferencing. Ge okay, so we go select georeference. So I did use our good friends bookmarks. So come on, it's drawing. Okay, so that is my corner of the building. So what I'm gonna go is now Oh, one thing that is very important, people are aware, uh, BIM or BIM data, it's a one-to-one -one scale. So there's no scaling. You don't have to scale that data. So we're gonna go move, okay, so I push it. It's sort of in my right location. So the first thing that we're gonna do is, if I click the move, you notice that our anchor, sorry, bottom, Let's see, there you go. So you notice that basically this is our anchor point. So it's the one that we can use to go up, if we go north, south. Um, it's tied to the sub-basement, and we don't want that. We don't want basically, our building is basically, that's the sub-basement, so it's around 13, 14 feet below ground. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna move this our anchor point to that corner. So what we're gonna do is you click Control. That looks correct. So now we can do elevate to ground. So what we're gonna do is just basically gonna lower the whole model because now that's my reference for ground. And I can then start playing. Okay, so now we know that that's the northwest corner of the building. So what we're gonna do is go here. Let's lift it a little bit. And we're gonna just. And there you go. It's a little bit because the terrain doesn't uh, we don't have a, an updated version of the terrain. We're using the default. And and now we can close. 
So let's say if I needed to, so I just georeference it, um, but if I needed to um, adjust the rotation, so you have your rotation tool, and remember, the rotation or the move is based on the anchor point. So if I, um, I will need to move my anchor point to here to be able to start using that as my starting point for my rotation. Um, so if we got everything, only real reference, you close it. I like to remove it, that way I don't have that layer roaming around, and then I just do drag and drop. Takes a little bit to load. Let's do, it. Let's do it with structural. So that's your structural information. And if we go turn off that a little bit, you're gonna see that, oops, too fast. You have uh, the soap structure of the building. And if I go here, sorry. Appearance, and I can do navigate underground. So if I go a little bit, so now you can see your part underground and your columns are basically touching the, and now I can do, add the rest of the building. That's gonna take a, a minute. Um, so Jeff mentioned that the rooms, so let's show you for the space management part, what we're gonna do is, and we're just gonna do the rooms. So that's basically the representations, how the rooms were defined in Rabbit. Um, so if we click on this one, we're gonna see that that room is basically, it's uh, for the department, it's a common space. The room number is 45 and the room name is Fort Area. If we go here, that's uh, human resources, the department, room number 48, and it's an office. Uh, we go here, it's accounting. Um, you can do change the symbology. We can do unique numbers. And now we can see uh, one categories. We want departments. And uh, I like those colors. So it shows you that basically how the building is um, distributed. You're gonna see that basically there's some gaps. You can see them here. And the reason why is because the spaces or the rooms are based, are bound by the ceiling. So on the rabbit side, if you set up the ceiling, it automatically bounds the space to the ceiling and the walls. So, but like in this case, I didn't set up the, the ceiling and you're gonna see that, um, where's my roof? My room, my roof is like that, so my rooms are bound now by the, and this helps uh, basically calculations of HVAC for healing and cooling, uh, or if you're a school, uh, you get federal money based on your square footage. So they like to make sure that their calculations on the square footage of each department is as accurate as possible. All right. All right. All right, thank you, David. Appreciate that. I'm gonna flip me back to. Yep, and then three, three. Three. There, we're back. Good, thanks, David, that was really good. So just to touch upon what David talked about, he's went through the, the positioning of your, your, your BIM files. It's the same as what you do with CAD. You wanna use the correct pro, uh, projected coordinate system, state plane or UTM. 
Um, no need to scale, like David mentioned. These buildings are drawn usually at a one-to-one -one scale. So in BIM, unlike CAD, rarely is there a case that you're gonna need to scale. Don't mix your units. That's really what it is. When you mix your units, it's pretty evident, right? So when you get, I, I forget the order, but when you start getting your building looking short and really wide, you know you've got a units issue, or if it looks really narrow and really tall, that's a really big indication that I've got my units wrong and I need to go look at that and get that sorted out. Um, yeah, I need to get that sorted out and, and f figure that out. And I, the other one too that David talked about is, is when you're georeferencing, these are really large models. Now obviously you guys know that we have a fairly small building that we're working with and it doesn't take long to load, 30 seconds or so I think David said. Um, but if you've got large, large buildings, you definitely want to narrow it down as much as you can when you georeference. Only use the one layer, maybe two layers when you're doing your georeferencing. All right. So the next section I want to talk about is converting Revit data to, to GeoDatabase. I've got my Revit data in my in ArcGIS Pro. It's displayed right. David's gone and I've got a David here and he went and put it in the right spot. So it's in the right location. Now I want to be able to do something with this Revit data other than just look at it and navigate through to it. So on these, there's definitely geoprocessing conversion patterns. Like I said before, CAD data and Revit data are very similar. They're both read-only data sources and they are just direct inputs to geoprocessing tools. It's just like a geodatabase or a shapefile, CAD and Revit are the same way, same pattern. You can use a common tool like feature class to feature class, my favorite tool. Doesn't matter what the data source is, you're gonna convert it. You can also use tools like some of these 3D specific tools that deal with multi-patches specifically, like 3D buffer, um, but we won't go too deep into that, but you can take a look at that. One thing new that was coming in is that we had a big ask and we knew it was coming about, that's fine, but I have a Revit, one Revit data doesn't necessarily contain all the subs, right? I'll get one Revit model and it'll be just architectural. Then I get another auto Revit model and that's my, uh, my, my uh, electrical or something like that. So we're very aware of that, we know that. So one of the tools that we're looking at, or we're gonna create is, it's a new GP tool, it's gonna be called uh, BIM file to geodatabase. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna be a bulk loader of BIM files. So right now you could go ahead and write a model or a script and you could convert your Revit model, models into geodatabases. What this tool is gonna to do is shortcut that and make it easier for you. You can bulk load your, all your Revit models, whether it be for one building or multiple buildings, into a single geodatabase or multiple, whatever you want them to map it. So that's something that's coming in the post 2.4 release. We're working on that right now, David and myself, and what we're hoping to get that on the next release. Um, as well as this, what we're just talking about right now is we're just re viewing Revit data inside ArcGIS Pro on the desktop, right? Um, we know very well that there's also other solutions out there within our product stacks that talks about building scene layers, um, whether SLPK or whatever you're gonna do, but you wanna publish these things so they can be consumed by other things and maybe they're a little lighter weight, a little easier to use. Um, right now, the process is you have to bring Revit as a data source into your Pro map and you publish that. So when we work on that tool to make a geodatabase, a bigger geodatabase with uh, dumping all of those in, we're gonna create another tool that will help you uh, make building scene layers from that as well so you can publish those. But that's another topic, we don't have time to go into that. <clears throat> Okay, so that's one thing. But now that we brought these geodatabases across, I've created a big model or a script and I've written and I've brought these things across, I wanna do something with it, right? I wanna do whatever we do in GIS with whatever your needs are. And we have um, we've have a long-standing editing tools, right? I've already talked to GP, but we have a lot of editing tools that work with multi-patch feature classes, just like any other feature class, whether it be 2D or 3D. And these tools have been enhanced, I guess, in some of them in the 2.4 release, but they're around for you to try now. But that's maybe putting specific textures on your multi-patch, slicing, merging, exploding. Did, from uh, Monday, when it was Madeline, right, Michael? Madeline did a demonstration up on stage where she was trying to find a movie location or something. And that, that think of that kind of experience, but using Revit data to, to do that. Or, or geodatabase coming from a Revit file to do that. But instead of, instead of doing that, we got a Michael here who's the expert in this stuff. So why don't we let Michael take a look at what he can do. Yeah, yeah okay. you're good. Okay guys, um, we have been uh, uh, putting this presentation together kind of thinking about exactly what the user wants, what the user has. Normally there's a Revit guy in the office and there's a GIS guy and normally they don't like to each other, they don't talk to each other.
But when they do, it's a little bit tough to just get, right? The Revit guy doesn't want to change, the GIS tag doesn't want to change, and then we got a bad divorce in the middle, right? So what we're really trying to do is do what we real people are trying to do, right? We're trying to have Revit, we're trying to have GIS, we're trying to bring it together. And that's the main thing that we're thinking about this, right? We are separate teams doing separate things, but at the end of the day, the main thing that we want to do, we have this Revit data, right? And we want to basically bring it into the GIS world. So we have a bin model that we just put into our world, right? We have to do all this georeferencing and all these things because somebody didn't do their job correctly. Somebody didn't properly set it up correctly on Revit, right? And that's great, but then now we have to do it in our site to georeference it to the right location. Okay, now me as a GIS professional, I have this model now. What do I do with it? Sure, I can make it look nice, I can publish it, I can do a lot of different things, but all of a sudden the boss tells me, well, that's not updated. We need a water fountain, we need this, we need to slice it, dice it, do things to it. Like, whoa, 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 this is just a file, right? So now, all of a sudden, we have to do edits to it. We have to modify it. So in order to do that, like Jeff was saying, we can convert this to an actual geo database. And once we do that, we go now into the deep details about 3D editing, okay? So all I'm gonna show you right now, it's gonna be editing this exact same BIM, okay? That we just talked about all, all up to this point. Now, let me just focus right now, because let's say I'm the GIS professional, Okay, and I know everything that there is to know about GIS, but I don't know what BMLs are. So I'm just gonna go here and I'm gonna go, okay, zoom to the layer. In this case, I'm gonna I have an actual bookmark here. I'm gonna simply just zoom into a location. This is my constructed site. So this is the site that we're gonna be building this new building. As you can see, this satellite imagery shows an actual section right here. And this is the real data that they're gonna place a building. Most of the time, this constructions, the building don't, ex don't exist there yet. We have the coordinates, we have the location, but the building doesn't exist. Persons, what they really want to do, simply have the model there, do virtual reality and see where the building is going to be at. So I'm going to turn on the building that I just got from wherever that person is, and then the building is going to come in here, and all this is, is just the bin. And that's great. I got it all there. It's all good to go. I'm happy with it. But all of a sudden, my boss says, like, well, that's not really right because this new section that we have here on the left, that's not yet there, and that's going to be completely separate. That's going to be owned by the city, for example. It's going to be part of the utility. It's going to be part of the, the terrain of the parks of the city that's going to be owning that. So all of a sudden, we have to break this thing apart. There's multiple ways that we can do this. Remember, this is the file your database feature class as a multi-patch. So now it's a little bit different than the BIM. Even though it's exactly the same, it looks the same, but now you can actually go into the details and edit them, okay? So the same tools that we have for multi-patch will apply in this case. So, and again, we're using the same building that we have seen so far that uh, David and, uh, and Jeff have shown. So now I can go ahead and select this, but you can see it's individual. It's not really all set. I can select faces. Then if I select this section, you can see it selects the, all, the entire thing. So it's a little bit complex. So but the first thing I want to do, I want to keep my boss happy. So I just want to select on this here and I want to completely remove it. So you see the floor at the bottom, it's all selected, everything, the foundation, but in this section, it's all here, right? So the first thing that I want to do, I simply just want to remove this. And I'm going to remove this precision uh, with an, um, I'm going to remove this with a precision of a slice. Almost think about it like a, like a cheese cutter. You know, I just like and cut everything that is right through it. But I also have interaction within this slice. I can do horizontal, vertical, or just free movement about it. So the way that I do this, simply just select it, click on edit tools, and then here I'm going to click on modify. And I'm going to click on this new tool called slice multi-patch. With my feature already selected, I can either select horizontal or vertical. In this case, I'm gonna select vertical. And now it's very important to determine if I'm gonna do solid or hollow. There's a very big difference about a hollow model and a solid model. Think about it like a cube, and then now you slice it right in the middle. Now you can take both of the pieces outside and you can see right through inside of them if it is a hollow model. If it is a solid, that will be a watertight seal of both of them. So it is very important with dealing with bin data because uh, everything is a wall within a wall within a wall. So if you slice that and didn't replace any of those faces, then we're gonna have a lot of holes through it. So you gotta make sure that once it's appropriate, either to have a self-healed type of model or not self-healed. This tool allows you to do all these functions very nice and easy, including with all the simple multi-patches also, not just specialized for BIM. Also another thing to note, most of the tools that I'll be showing right now in this presentation are all new for 2.4. If you have 2.3, they're not there, they're in 2.4, okay? 
All right, so once I finish doing that, I'm simply just gonna click over here, click here, and now I have this transparent type of plane that comes up, which I can interactively completely move. In this case, I wanna simply just rotate it so that I can get exactly that section right there. The blue and the red basically means which, which one is the one that you have uh, the slice, and we will have options also to say, keep one over the other one, or just right now, by default, just keeps both of them. So you have options to do uh, that also. Then once you're here, simply just go ahead and move it right kind of through there. I don't wanna get necessarily the roof. And then just gonna go there. And then once I'm done, simply just gonna go and slice it. Now what this will do, will actually take that geometry and completely slice it into two features inside of the database now. So for one feature, now you have two different ones, as you can see here. So I completely sliced that one over there. And the feature that I had down there, it is based not on the absolute height, so it's actually based on the ground. That's why when you start slicing things, now you completely divide them, and the properties that affect on one will not affect on the other one. Now it's individual features. So it's very important to determine that, because once you start breaking apart this BIM model, all these connections that were together, a wall inside of a window or the window inside of a wall, things like that, it's very important because you're now breaking those things apart. You're breaking that connection. So it is important to determine that once you start working here, um, you have to have a clear understanding of those properties, okay? So now I have my feature here, and that feature is completely individual now than the building. So it's not part of the building itself. Now I can simply just go ahead, completely remove it, detach it completely from the building. So very simple, I'm able to just simply just slice that. Now let's go here on a different example, and I'm gonna select here a section here, but in this case, I'm gonna do a slice, but I'm gonna do a vertical slice up here, right? And I'm gonna rotate it, right? But let's say I can just slice that new section, and that section is gonna be industrial, for example, and then the other section is gonna be residential. That works also, but I could also just do a simple horizontal one, and this way I can simply just click over here. Now I have full access by floor for floor. Now you see only this section was connected, so only this section is the one that is actually selected. This one will have no effect. I can do multiple selection or I can do feature by feature. In this case, simply just click on slice, and there we go. Now you see how the, the other features are coming through? Still drawn, and there we go. Now do remember, Something very important, we're dealing with multiple 3D geometries. You have to make sure your hardware is set up properly and correctly so that it can actually draw a lot of these uh, geometries. We're not working with simple points and lines anymore. We're working with a lot of geometries, a lot of triangles. So just make sure that you have the right equipment in order to run it. Otherwise, it's gonna be very slow and it's just gonna be very uh, graphics uh, dependent. So just make sure of that. So there, once I change that, then it did my uh, slice, so now I have that geometry completely different from the ones that I, that I cared here. Now, what I'm gonna do now, I'm simply just gonna undo this, and I'm gonna go back to another original location over here, but this case, what I really wanna do, I wanna focus more on textures, right? So right now it came like that, sure, we're gonna have textures at some point, but what if I actually have the blueprint, where I have the, the textures, somebody already, an architect, has an idea about what to put in a wall, colors and things like that, I can simply just try to patch it all together into the same feature. So in order to do that, I'll go here to this tool called multi-patch texture, right? And let's say I wanna select this face right here. Now I can simply just use a simple color to just color it, for example, a switch green. And I can do face by face and color individual faces completely um, by the main planar face. That, that's very important when doing construction, especially for a BIM. This new face of this building will be constructed in green in two, 2020. Then this red one is gonna be constructed in 2021. So it's easy to just divide what sections are um, by plane. Not only that, but it can also do complete sections of the entire building to apply to all. But that's great for symbology, but also what I really, really wanna do is simply just add textures. So here I went ahead and just took a picture of a facade of some of this area right here that are very important for a lot of users to use, for example, brick, 
not just any break, a red break or a brown break or type of symbology that normally the city planners, they care a lot about the colors and the facades, if it's a desert city or if it is a European city. So this type of textures are important. So for example, here, I went ahead and simply just took a picture with my phone. I added it over here. Now the picture came out here. Now you can see how the picture is there, right? It can zoom in and move my cursor around it. All I want to do, I simply just want to place it somewhere here in one of these uh, faces right here. Place it there, and I really want just the break. So you see how I'm zooming in here? Simply just want to get that break somewhere here. And of course, I can just move it around just enough that I can, you know, just, just place it in a just proposed location, and then just simply just apply it. And then that's it. Of course, those bricks are very big. I don't think you gotta buy those ones in Home Depot or any place like that. But just to give you a glimpse, an idea, a very simple uh, um, idea, right? And that texture, I simply just took with my phone. So it's very simple to just go in the field and just you know, get a screenshot and then just have it right there. Another important tool um, that uh, we included in 2.4, it's an explode tool. And think about it, explode. I know the word is very negative, but what it really means as a 3D geometric model, it takes a simple cube that has basically six phases and just explode them into individual phases. Remember, this is watertight, right? All this geometry is all solid. And when it comes in as a, as a BIM, it also comes solid most of the time. But once you want to edit them, you can. So you have to use the explode tool in order to separate each one of the individual phases. So then you can go ahead and do editing on top of them. Okay, or you want to merge some of them. For example, let's say, okay, this beam came out like this, right? And then I have the roof and I have this wall, but they're not together. So I want to merge them together. I want to do the watertight of them. Well, simple. Simply just select both of them. Now go here to merge. Now we included a new algorithm on the actual uh, merge functionality so that it just simply just merged them. This is also new for 2.4. Before, we had the merge, but it didn't work with multi-patches. Now it does. Simply just click on merge, and it does exactly what you expect. It just takes those two geometries, and it just merged them together. There we go. That's it. So now I can click here, and you see how I get all the other features there. Now, that's all great and all, but now that it is on GIS, I can even take more advantage of a lot of different functions that I couldn't before. So for example, let's say, well, yeah, that's great and all, but I have another model here that I want to mix the BIM with the actual feature class. And that feature class will, for example, will be a big water fountain that they're going to put over here. So okay, well, if you want to do that, you can combine the BIM, um, simply just turn on the polygon here. Now that polygon is going to represent a big water fountain that they're trying to do. So simply just click on symbology, click on properties, then click here, going to select an animated field. And in this section, I'm going to select water. I'm going to select a kind of bluish water. Eh, yeah, why not? Then go here, small waves. I'm going to do a simple direction of about 135 degrees. I'm going to do ripple, and then just going to click on apply. Then once you have that, and you see like the water reflection of, of the beam next to it, and it just makes the GIS data plus the beam data all come together. Of course, this is just a very simple example. Um, but what I'm trying to show is that the workflow that you can do all together, uh, working with BIM, GIS, in the same workflow. And uh, that concludes the portion of my section. So back to you, Jeff. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, Michael. That was great. Appreciate it. Wrong machine. Yeah, there we go. Good, good. All right, great. So I'd like to thank both these guys. Great demos, showing you what you can do with it. It's kind of exciting. Um, all the things you can do with this stuff. Um, one thing I want to talk about is what Michael went into a little bit is why do we convert to GeoDatabase? Like he said, I want to be able to do some edits. I, I'm lucky enough to have a David and a Michael so I can do them both sides, but not everybody has a David and a Michael. Um, we want to convert because we want to put it into our authoritative content. We want to be able to use it with the rest of our surrounding information um, within maybe some facility management work that I have to do. 
So as you can see also, you see these beautiful drawings and I wanted to get into the data model idea that what David was, and Michael have been talking about is that just because something was done within Revit and it's fine, just like in CAD, it doesn't mean that it works for us in GIS, in GIS as well. If you look at a couple of these examples, and these are true examples that we've had, right? I can't tell you where, but I'll, I'll, true examples. But these are, these are ideas where somebody has drawn the floor in Revit, but they didn't bother putting in the hole where the stairs go through. And maybe for their needs, it's fine and dandy, who cares, it's fine. But for us, it looks terrible, right? We can't have that, we can't calculate the size of the floor that way because we don't know, because we have to cut that out. And that's where you need, maybe use the tools that Michael's talked about, start cutting things out and cleaning up this model so that it's usable for you in GIS. Um, Along with that is attributional updates as well if you want to start combining fields or doing different fields and doing those things. Another great example is, um, is this building right here. You can see in the Revit on the right, what they've done is that they've uh, put the limit offset at 141 feet. And those are rooms. Remember David showed you the rooms in there? Those third floor, that's not definitely not what we want to be able to model. So there's tools like what Michael has to be able to slice those things and get that to work for your data model. Um, and this is just another example of that, how um, sometimes Revit data can be cumbersome within GIS. So, well, actually we're in pretty good timing today, guys, way to go. Um, so the overview, what we really talked about, first of all, we talked about what is BIM, and we meant what is Revit, you guys are using that already. I showed you a little bit of the direct read, how it's, how it's portrayed or how we set it up inside of ArcGIS Pro and how we use it. Um, Michael went, or David went in to show us how we can position a Revit file and how to do it correctly so we can get it in the right spot. And then we talked a little bit about the conversion tools, um, BIM file to Geo GeoDatabase, which is coming in our future release. That'll help you, but you could do it now, right now, and convert it to a GeoDatabase. And once we've done that, then we got Michael involved and he was able to modify the geometry and the attributes if you needed to, to be able to make it work for our needs, modify things if, if you have to. You don't necessarily have to do it in the Revit file. So I think that covers everything, doesn't it? Um, as always, we're recommend to have these in here. Please give us your feedback. This is the first time we've done this session, the three of us. Um, and I really would like to hear your feedback on this. If there's something you liked or didn't like or something different you want to see, let us know. Because that's what, when we create these sessions six months ago, that helps us um, understand what we want to show. So it really helps with the feedback. So I appreciate any feedback you guys could give us. Um, one thing I want to mention here too, and um, yeah, I've got the typo. CC picked up the typo on this one too. But um, these are other sessions that are coming up. The only one is in the bottom one. It is the uh, integrating ArcGIS and Autodesk is actually on, is it on Wednesday? Anyways, double check your Thursday. Check your schedule anyways, but. Oh, right, third one to the top. Yeah, the possible, uh, what's possible with Esri and Autodesk, that's actually on Wednesday, but that's the, um, 10th, not the 11th. Anyways, but here's other examples of that. So anyways, I want to thank everybody for your time. Um, and, and I guess we'll open it up to any questions that you guys might have. All right, we'll do a couple questions and then come see us. But okay, which question? Yeah, that should f be fine. As as the, the, yes, for the georeferencing process. After that, you can put it on a global scene or anything. Now the the projection on the fly engine will take care of the rest. But for the georeferencing process, it has to be in a project coordinate system. And then the second question would be, so when you brought that point in from BIM, is there any way to like set that to automatically pick up that survey point, or are you always going to have to hand edit take that control point to that survey. Oh, so she's asking about when you did it the first time. Is that the last time we need to do it, right? I've done oh, it yes. Is, it, is, it, is there any way to do it programmatically so that you oh. don't have to hand edit it at all? Yeah. So that that center oh, so. point comes in as that survey point? Uh, yes, but it's on the rabbit side. You have to do it directly on the rabbit side. So, so you have to put the values for the north and east in, in the values of the coordinates, and then you just only need a PRJ. In the project point. Yes. Okay. Uh, project base point. Yeah. The question is, is there any way to do it 
question. Did everybody get the question? Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah? All right. Question. Anybody? I want the mic. So when you're doing the slicing, vertical slicing, is there any way to snap your angle to the picture so that it's definitely aligned with the line rather than eyeballing it? Yes, that's a great question. The question was if there's any capability for slicing um, a feature, but in order to slice it to snap the feature, and the answer is yes. I didn't particularly do it in the demo, but you're able to snap. You're able to get precision uh, by typing in also constraints, and you're also able to just eyeball in it. Just the way that I was doing it is just kind of eyeballing. But the same way, if you have snapping turn on, it will work. If you have 3D grid on, it will snap to the 3D grid. And if you have the constraint, you can also type in the value. And if you also have a profile view turned on, it will work as well through all those scenarios. Great question. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Um, the question is, um, how do I preserve the colors while bringing it in uh, from BIM to uh, as a file view database? Okay, so right now the file view database that I constructed there, um, I created just to be as, as basically a, a, what we call a naked geometry. It's just like the simple basic geometry and it comes out like you saw right there. Um, you can preserve the colors in different ways. Um, one thing is that, sure, you can assign color by face, but the preserving on, on the colors itself, there's a symbology, uh, I believe it's in the UI, the one that we have a drop dropdown, uh, yeah. Yeah. and then we can choose the symbology that comes automatically with it, and then automatically we'll redraw most of the, uh, uh, the colors. For example, that's very important when having utilities like water, normally it's in blue, for example, hot water is in red, things like that are very important, so we know there's like, um, systematic and symbology attached to a particular geometries. So uh, in terms of, of colors, yes. Uh, in terms of textures and stuff, like what uh, uh, Jeff was saying, not yet. But, yes. But I have to do it layer by layer. I cannot uh, have to throw a, a layer file from the, the Revit file and then reuse it for the whole uh, file in the file view database. Right, as once it's converted as a feature class, yeah, we'll reread it uh, the same way as you would do it for a point, line, or polygon. It have to be by layer by layer. It doesn't get any special treatment because the software knows that it's just a feature class, so we have to, have to make sure that we have control over that. So, good question. Yes, sir. So Yes, that is a great question, and honestly, that's like the million dollar question right now. Uh, and yes, we know it. We know that uh, there's a limitation at this point. We are working very hard to try to get that as solved as possible, quickly as possible. Um, so anytime soon, uh, between one to next couple of uh, uh, weeks or a year, uh, we might you know, uh, make a change on the code. But for right now, as currently as it exists on 2.4, which is what you showed today, we do not support it just yet. But we are working on it. We know exactly what we need to do. We just have to and, figure and, it out. And textures are, textures are something that, that is a lot more attainable when you're talking materials. Now that's next level and, and you're asking a lot more work, I guess I would say. So um, yeah, just be aware right. of that. Okay. Okay. And, and that's a great question, and also just to point out something, it's not just about the texture, it's not about the materials, it's not about the colors. Each one of the faces that you see there, each one of the simple faces, they could have up to three or five different textures inside of each one of the simple faces. There's the face cooling, there's the interior face, there's the exterior face, there's another glossiness, roughness, all those are individual textures inside of each one of the face itself. So it might look just like a simple texture, a simple material, but there's a lot of layers that are involved with that. We have to make sure that we respect that when it comes in and we also show it appropriately. So that's why it's, it's a little bit more harder than, than what it really looks. Like in the plenary that um, Madeline was showing the demo, I created that flying saucer that she put over there and I created a lot of different layers in order to get that glossiness, that roughness, that look. So it's, it's more complex than that. When bringing a BIM, we have to make sure we either do it right or we don't do it at all. And we haven't yet get to the point that we feel comfortable enough to bring it in. But we're working on it. Great question. So I, oh, oops. 
Sorry. Great question. Restate the question. So the question that you ask is, uh, I didn't have to rotate the model. Um, that's basically your question. Uh, is the reason why I didn't have to rotate it with the tools is because that file has the true north already embedded into it. So if the file doesn't have the true north embedded, so the degrees that is basically deviating from the north, you have to use the rotate tool. In that case, basically, for the example that I did, I already had the degrees there, so I didn't have to rotate it. Yes. Uh, no, but I can show you the trick to uh, basically make sure. Yeah, because as Jeff was mentioning, uh, so you have different teams working on a building. You have the architecture, you have the group that does the MEP, uh, and each one is working on different models. And at the end, suddenly they just show up in one single model. Oh, sorry, so I misunderstood the question. Uh, no, we don't do the shared coordinates. Uh, so basically, you can have to georeference each of the buildings individual. Each building is that. All right, um, back here, you have a next question. I knew it would be asked. I knew it would be asked. I, I don't want to be on the record on that one, so. I'll take that one. All right, so the good good question. You're saying, okay, great, I've done my GIS. I've made it the way I want it. Now I want to put it back to a Revit file. So I want to export to Revit instead of export to CAD, right? I want that too. But it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's not something that's on our, to be quite frank, it's not something on our roadmap any sort of time soon. It's, it's, um, <clears throat> Until we've gotten a little further with some of these other things, then we'll look at that. But at this point, it's not on a roadmap anytime soon to, to go to Revit. So, okay? Okay. Yes, yeah, so when you bring the, the, the BIM into, uh, if it comes in as one feature, it comes in multiple features, it really depends on how the geometry was originally constructed, for example. Um, I normally construct my own BIM models and they come in all solid, all in one. This one in particular, um, uh, David constructed it and he constructed it as the very complex way, so each wall, everything individually, it's its own, feature inside of the layer itself. So each one of them is a file, it's a, it's, a, it's a row. So it makes it really nice and simple to either merge them or explode them. But it's not the case in, in, you know, in, in all the cases. So in other words, sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. So it really depends on how the source data comes in as. And then once you convert it, we just read it directly as it was created. The good thing is that we do have the currently now the tools in 2.4 to either regroup them or disassemble them. Before we didn't. If, if it's separate, I color them separately and then I merge them and they hold yes. the colors? Yes. Correct. Yes. And that's what we're trying to simplify. I mean, the merge tool makes no sense if we don't have an explode tool because you either break them or put them together. However, whatever setting that you do in colors uh, and things like that, we will respect that. We will still honor that. So. Any other questions? No? Okay. okay well, well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys.